Element Church, so glad you're joining us today. I want to welcome St. Charles, everybody watching online. So excited. We have Psalms, this incredible series where we're going to get some inspiration and some very practical things from this amazing book called Psalms for your everyday life. And today, Pastor Leo Crosby on my executive team is going to be sharing from his favorite psalm. Uh, he's been here at Element Church for over seven years now. Uh, he's really my right-hand guy in terms of our executive team. And he is kicking this series off five years? Well, it's felt like seven. It's really actually <laughs> felt a little bit longer than that. This will be year six. Year six. It just goes fast. It, it, it does. Goes, it goes fast. And uh, so, Pastor Leo, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Element Church. Three kids, 16, almost 15, and a little, those both boys, Levi Lincoln and a little girl that's 11. LaDonna and I will celebrate 24 years. Uh, my role here at Element is uh, I came on the executive team just a little over five years ago now. This will be year six for me, and I'm very excited about that. But I get to do a lot of the ministry things, a lot of the behind the scenes, the day to day with the rest of the executive team, uh, just making sure that things are going forward and we're moving the ball down the field. So Great. I have a lot of fun with what I do. So tell us about the psalm that you're going to be teaching from today and uh, what, what, why this psalm? Yeah, Psalm 37. So I had, it was one of the first. Uh, verses, you know, you hear people have these life verses. And I remember asking someone, what's your life verse? And Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I mean, that's a really great verse. And so I got to reading it and I realized that the person that was sharing it with me, they took that verse and they just went, that's like that. They didn't read the rest of the Psalm. Yeah. And there's so much more there about how we can handle the anxiety and the stress of life when everyone else, it looks like everyone else is succeeding. God, why can't we, or, you know, I just wish I could do this. And, and it really gives us some really good, uh, some tools and things we can do for when we see when our when we're in those stressful and anxiety driven moments in our life, but but also at the same time what not to do, and uh, especially when we're looking around and we're seeing people that are that are succeeding, people that I can think in times in my life where they're succeeding and that they're not following God, but man, their life they've got the money, they've got the car, they've got the house, and I'm sitting here serving God and I'm going God, I just you know I'm serving you, but man, the desire of my heart really would be that vacation or that new car and. So I think really when we get into the, the passage itself and understanding God wants us to live a fulfilled and happy life. But when our desires begin to align with his, we can face just about any situation we're in and still find delight in life and, and our desires can be met. Sounds great. Can't wait to hear this exciting message. Element Church, please give a warm welcome to Pastor Leo Crosby. Hello and welcome. So glad you're with us this weekend. Good morning, St. Charles. Those of you joining online right now, we want to say a special welcome to you. I'm excited for this series. Before we get into this, though, as we were cutting that video, one of the questions that Pastor Eric asked was, tell us a little something about yourself that many may not know. And so I answered, and I want to make sure that I'm the one that gets to tell this story because it's on video and I'm a little nervous about when it might come out, and I want to be able to control the narrative at this point. So... <laughs> My wife and I were married uh, tw almost 24 years ago now, and we took our honeymoon. Her parents, her dad did a lot of traveling, and so he gave us tickets down to Hawaii, so we were able to enjoy our honeymoon in Hawaii. And then we're at a massive flea market one day. Again, I'm a newlywed, 20, 20 21 years old, uh, young guy, just excited to be married. And uh, of course, I'm taking my wife shopping so that she's happy throughout the day, like I started on the right foot there. And uh, she says, hey, let's get toe rings. And I said, okay. And for the next 10 or 12 years, I had a toe ring on my toe. Uh, if you think less of me right now, I'm sorry, but remember, I was 20, <laughs> newly married. My, whatever my wife, basically whatever she asked for in that period of life, she got. And so uh, and we're, that's part of the reason we're still happily married today. But I wanted to be the one to share that story and, and at least, you know, because you never know when those things are going to come out. Like it exists. The things that exist on our video from some of the takes we do, uh, there's, it's just fun and funny. And that was one of those I wanted to make sure you heard from me, not from our media team. They really do a great job. You know, what I love about the Psalm, the Psalms are such a, uh, the way I like to say it is they're really one of the most human books of the Bible that exists. Meaning that you see a full range of emotion and life throughout the book of Psalms. It's this, it's this 
gathering of, of songs and poems and, and just life's struggles. You see the psalmist at his deepest, darkest moment and where he's almost you know, just in desperation. Uh, he, he's maybe going through a little bit of depression. We see psalmists where they, they're at the height of their excitement. They love God. They're like, everything's going right. And they're ecstatic about what they're doing and they're worshiping God. And, and you see this full range of emotions throughout the book of Psalms. In fact, if you're not aware, prior to our current modern day music, it was very normal uh, in church that we would sing hymns. Uh, we would all open up a book and there would, we would all, basically every church sang the basic same group of songs. And even before that were the book of Psalms. Most of the songs that the church would sing for majority of the early church life was out of the book of Psalms. So I would encourage you as we're in this series, if you haven't, uh, incorporated the Psalms as part of your daily routine, whether that's through either just reading of the word, but maybe make it a matter of prayer. There's a number of songs that you can just pray over your life. I'd encourage you to do that. There's some great songs on Spotify, Psalm 23, Psalm 46. In fact, um, there's a group called Shane and Shane that did an entire album of Psalms, and they're just literally singing modern songs from the book of Psalms. I encourage you as we go through this series that you just open up your word and spend a little time on your own in the book of Psalms, it will drastically increase what God does for you in these moments over the next few weeks as we start this series. As I mentioned in the video, we're starting with Psalm 37. Uh, I, this Psalm, I could probably spend three or four weeks on this Psalm alone. We're going to pull some key things out. This is what's traditionally called a wisdom song, uh, meaning there's some tidbits of wisdom in it. It's a Proverbs type song. It's actually an acrostic poem. Each, of the first, each stanza is a first letter from the Hebrew alphabet, and it walks down through the Hebrew alphabet as an acrostic poem. And so you'll see some of this Psalms where it jumps around, and you'll see as I do this today, it can be some random thoughts because he was following a certain format of how the psalmist was writing this particular psalm. But it starts out really what the bulk and the whole psalm looks like. It starts out in verse 1, and it really sets the tone for our conversation today. Psalm chapter 37, verse one. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Another translation says, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. This Psalm right out of the gate says, in life, there's gonna be people that succeed that aren't following the will of God. Don't let that bother you. That's Leo's translation. There are gonna be people that succeed that aren't following the will of God. Don't let that bother you. And the reality is we see this in our lives. If you've never experienced this as a believer, you, you, you just, you're maybe not looking hard enough, but I can't imagine anyone, I don't know anyone who hasn't experienced it. I haven't looked at someone going, man, their life seems to be going great. They've got the car, they got the house, they got the job, and they're not living according to God's word. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. And the psalmist is saying, Here's some things that are gonna steal your joy, steal your hope if you focus on those moments. We see it also, the psalmist I believe would have seen it as in the societal norms as a whole, not just in the individual moment, but as they looked around in the other kingdoms and the other kings that were expanding and they were starting to take over large territories and those kinds of things begin to see it. And he says, what we consider to be good the world calls evil and what we consider evil, the world calls good. And th there are times in our lives that they're going to succeed. There are times in our lives it's going to appear as if they're actually winning. We see this throughout our society today. A couple examples I wanna give you uh, in this. First of all, is, is in, from an individual standpoint, we see this in Hollywood. Hollywood is probably, uh, you know, and it rightly so deserves some, some of the attention it gets from this standpoint, but, but most of Hollywood isn't promoting God's word. We agree with that. I think, I think most of us, most of Hollywood isn't living according to the word of God. Two weeks ago on USA Today, the article headline was Robert De Niro has his seventh kid at 79 years old. Now, first of all, seven kids, for those of you that have a lot of kids, God bless you. All right, like I got three and I'm, like, I'm happy. Like I know what three was good. I was happy with two, LaDonna wanted a little girl. So we've got three, we've got our little girl, but but he was, he's 79 years old. Now here's what's interesting. Of those four, of those seven kids, there's actually four different moms in that scenario. Now, if you're here today and you are following God and you have seen yourself in this life and before where maybe you've got a couple kids from some different dads, but you're under the grace of God now, know that God's love is still there for you. All I'm doing is showing because the article ends celebrating 
Robert De Niro's successes, his Golden Globes, his Oscars, uh, his President's uh, Medal that he received uh, a few years ago. And they're saying that it doesn't matter who you are as a person, it's more important what you achieve in life. And that's the world's definition of success. We also see this in the industry where money, because money is such a, uh, a desire that many of us have. Money is, is such a definition of success. Uh, and there's been a number of sermons that we've talked over the years with this, but we see this in probably one of the most brilliant minds of our time in Elon Musk. The man's ability to see and what he sees is absolutely incredible. To do what he's done is, is, is just sh nothing short of impressive. But Elon Musk is not a follower of the word of God. Now, he also believes that we have a population crisis, not that we have too many, that we are actually in decline as a population. And so he's doing his part. He has 10 kids. God bless you, Elon Musk. Three different moms, four of them out of wedlock. We see these individuals that appear to be succeeding, to appear to be very successful, a lot of money, a lot of fame, a lot of fortune. And sometimes it's hard for us to look at that. And I'm gonna say some things out loud today that many of us have thought. We look at that and go, man, that would be a great lifestyle. If I just had that kind of money. Like Elon Musk doesn't have to worry about bills ever again. Like he, he, he's just like, he sees it, he wants it, he buys it. You know, that country, I don't know. But we see this on the broader scope as well as I think the psalmist did in society as a whole, where society is saying, if you can, you can live your life outside of scripture and still see it. Or we see evil being promoted, what God calls evil, society is now calling good. And we see this on the broader scope. In fact, I believe the moral fabric of our American society began to deteriorate. And there's a number of issues that, that over the years that you've seen when we removed the 10 commandments from school, the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. But I really believe the, 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 the culminating moment most recently was in the mid 90s when we separated character from someone's accomplishments at the highest level of the president when we, with Bill Clinton and, what his, and the scandals he went through. Now, this is not a Republican and Democratic conversation. Really, since Bill Clinton, there has not been someone who has lived a moral lifestyle that really has been put toward the presidency of the United States because we say it no longer matters how they live outside in their lives as long as they can do X, Y, and Z and we can you know, lower taxes and increase revenues and, and do all the social things that we should be doing as a country. That's become the expected norm. In fact, today, and there's a website, some of you are aware of this, that over the last three years has exploded onto the scene. This website is nothing short of modern day prostitution. It is telling women that you can take the body God's given you, you can take photos and videos of it, upload it, and you can have subscribers pay you. It's monthly subscription prostitution is what it is. This website has grown so much over the last three years, over 174%. It went from $370 million in revenue to over $2.5 billion in revenue in just the last three years. 190 million active subscribers to these websites. Society has told young women that they can use the body they have to make a whole lot of money and not even think about the repercussions of what they're doing in 10, 20, 50 years from now. And society is just going, yeah, so what? It is even coming closer to home where we as believers can see society winning because we can't even tell our story anymore, the good news of the gospel in something as simple as a middle school play. My wife, who is uh, my daughter's part of Young People's Theater here at the St. Charles Community College, and she's been doing her production this this weekend, and my wife was in a conversation during a rehearsal just a couple weeks ago with a middle school teacher here, and she, she teaches in the St. Charles County. I'm not gonna call out the school district because this is a, a problem across the board. It's not a specific district or school. She wanted to tell a Christmas story. She sends it up to get approval for it. Mind you that, that in her own words, she's a self-professing atheist and promoting this story, and she gets told, Sorry, it's too religious. We, in the current climate, we just don't wanna mess with that. But they're proud about all the other agendas that they're sending out. And it's going forward. 
And so as a parent, you begin to get worried. And when you look at society and you look at these things, I begin to worry about what's the message my daughter's gonna hear in, ten or, in, in five or six years when her body's fully developed and her friends are making hundreds of thousands of dollars over a month and she's choosing to live according to the word of God. What are, what are my boys having to fight day in and day out when they're in a school right now that their bathrooms were built with gender neutral in mind, meaning there's no urinals in the boys' bathrooms? When I stop and I focus on that and I see that, it, it begins to steal and rob me of the joy and the hope I have for my own kids. The hope that I have for this great country that I absolutely love and have enjoyed the life I have because of Americans, of years of America's history. And that is what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers. So we're gonna look at three things today. We're gonna look at three things that will steal and kill your joy, joy killers. These things you should avoid when you're looking at, at society like this. And three things that we must embrace. The first thing we're gonna look at, things to avoid, is a joy killer of fret. Verse one, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. We see three different times in the Psalm that Psalmist says, do not fret. Because when we see societies winning as a whole, going against the grain of God, in light of eternity, what the psalmist is saying here, it's just like the grass, here and gone. A friend of ours brought Lene some flowers after her production Friday night, handed them to her. By Saturday morning, and any of you have ever had flowers, she's got them in the vase. You've already got a couple of them that are just like limped over and, you know, dead. That's, what the, that's the image the psalmist is trying to paint here because we see these things, while in us, the current reality, our current situation, the 1990s for many of us, I won't make you all feel old this morning, but it was not as close as you think it was a few years ago. We're past the 30 year mark for the 90s now. In fact, I saw something this morning. If you were born in the 70s, you were, it is closer to World War II, the year you were born, than it is to today. Just make you feel good while we're on the, on the topic. <laughs> But when you look at some of the, the, the world powers over the years that have been successful, that haven't followed the will of God, what you begin to see is when you begin to see things in light of eternity, you begin to understand how really small in scope some of these things are. When we look at the world power of the Egyptian empire, who in the Old Testament is often thought of uh, as, as a picture in the Old Testament as Satan's dominion, Satan's empire, the the ancient Egyptian world empire, the near ancient Egyptian, about 500 years of 6,000 years of known history. That only represents 8% of history. The Shang dynasty in China, which lasted for 554 years, the longest running dynasty in China, represents 9% of history. The Roman empire, which lasted for 1,000 years, which many of the New Testament believers we're surrounded by 16.7% of history. What's interesting is Nero's reign, who Nero in his time was adamant. He was one of the most evil rulers in all of history. If you're familiar with ancient history, he's the equivalent of Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler in his day. He would take Christians for fun. He'd put them in the Colosseum and he'd release wild animals, lions, bears, and, and uh, on, on these Christians for entertainment. He reigned for 13 years in the midst of the birth of the, new, of the early church. The New Testament church is growing and exploding in the season of Nero's reign. And in the time, I'm sure many Christians were sitting here going, oh my goodness, 13 years. God, how long are you gonna let this man live and reign? What's interesting, those 13 years only represent 0.22% of all of known history. Let's come modern day a little, a little closer. What we have today, the totalitarian society of the USSR and Nazi Germany, which if you really want some fun, go read the book, Live Not By Lies, or some similarities to what we're seeing today. That's free, it's not in my notes. The USSR from 1924 to 1991, which is a long time, that's a lifetime for many of us. 1% of history. Nazi Germany represents 
2% of all known history. The United States has only been a world power for about 78 years. We've existed for longer, but we've only been a world power for about 78 years, which only represents 1.3% of all of known history. It will fade and be gone. If the Lord tarries, what's interesting is, is when you think of these things, that 1.3%, let's just take that, let's go, that's 6,000 years, all right? So we've been around for 4% 4, 4 of all of history from, from 1776 on, about equivalent about 4%. Let's assume that, we, we, that if things ended today, 60,000 years from now, that would be 0.4%. 600,000 years from now, 0.04%. The thing about eternity is it's not 60,000, it's not, it's not even 600%, which is 0.004% of all of history. And yet we're gonna spend eternity, hundreds of billions of years enjoying heaven and earth. So the, the psalmist understood he had to have, in order to, in order to not let stress and anxiety, not to let his joy be stolen, he understood he had to look at things in an eternal mindset, in an eternal view. Verse seven says, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Many of us have experienced this over the years. Maybe you work in a, uh, an environment where many of your colleagues and even some of those that are getting the promotion aren't following God. Maybe gossip's their tool. Maybe they like to just plant little seeds of doubt in leadership's mind about you or other people. And next thing you know, they're getting the promotion. Maybe they're the ones that slept their way to the top. Maybe the ones that cheated and lied on their resume. Maybe they're the ones that stole someone else's work and presented it as their own. And what scripture says is don't fret when you see those schemes coming to pass. It steals your joy. It steals your hope. It takes your eyes off of God and puts it into the moment. And again, in verse eight, he says, do not fret for it only causes harm. When we worry, when we let anxiety take over in our lives, it doesn't lead to anything good. It doesn't lead to anything but a lack of joy and a lack of hope. It only causes harm and it begins to harm you and it begins to harm those around us. The next joy killer that we see is that of envy. He said, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Envy is desiring the things that we can't have, the things that someone else has because of their money, their access to it. That's what it's talking about. If I have a sin that I struggle with a lot, it's the sin of envy. Wanting more than what I have, wanting more than what I'm able to do. And I thought it would be fun. This, I, I have always been an early adopter of technology. And so I thought it would be fun. I put my image into an AI tool. Ask me in 20 years if I regret this. Uh, I put my image into an AI tool this week and I said, show me a picture of a successful Leo living the life of luxury that is uh, surrounded by cars and just a successful businessman. And this is what AI produced for us. <laughs> Not sure why everyone laughs at that. I did start a diet after I saw that though. <laughs> Honestly, if I wasn't following the will of God in my life, this is probably the Leo that would exist. Because for me, I always want more. I want more money. It's, it's, some of it's competitive. I wanna beat the guy next to me. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna be the most successful at what I do. But if this Leo existed, I don't know that my kids would have a dad. I don't know what number of marriage I would be on. I don't know where I'd be at in life other than really financially well off. Recently, I was watching uh, the new film air. It's the story of Michael Jordan signing with Nike. And what's interesting is the, the subtle story behind there, that film is Michael Jordan's agent. And during the course of it, he's talking and he says, I, I don't need friends, I've got clients. He says, I may die alone, but I'm gonna die rich. And at the end of the film, it talks about, and sorry, spoiler, if you're planning to watch this, just plug your ears for a minute. But, but at the end of the film, it says he was able to sell his agency for $100 million and was seen eating alone that night at dinner. When our motivation and our goal is success, as world defines it through power, through pleasure, through prosperity, all of which take money to achieve. 
We're setting our hearts and our desires. We're becoming envious of what we can. What scripture tells us our goal to be is to learn to be content with what we have. And I have fought over the years. I have prayed God to help me with this over the years. And he's, he's established some things. And really probably one of the things that have really hit home for me is Philippians chapter four, verse 11, where the apostle Paul speaking says, not that I am speaking of being in need for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. I know how to have little and I know how to have much. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What Paul's saying, whether you've got a lot or you've got a little, your focus is on God, you'll be able to do what he's asked you to do. Some of you have been, and this is not anti-rich, okay? Some of you are gifted with the ability to make money. It is a spiritual gift for the purpose of generosity. In Romans chapter 12, when it talks about the gifts of the church, it talks about those you are able to give, give generously. We have a number of people here at Element Church that are, that is their, that is the definition of who they are as an individual. They give very generously over the years. I'd like to tell you that Leo in that picture would wanna make money so that I can give to the church, but the reality is Leo in that picture wants to make money so I can have more money. So for me, I go, God, I'm gonna be happy with whatever you've given me, a lot or a little. And he's blessed me. He's blessed me because I've been faithful with what he's given me. I haven't missed a tithe payment, check, whatever words you wanna use there in years. I'm, I don't say that to be proud. Like that's the only way God has control of my financial life is when I put him first in it because otherwise it would be me. I can tell you exactly right now to a penny how much that is every, every two weeks and what I would do with that money if it was mine in my pocket. But I want God to be first. I wanna be content with whatever he's given me. Don't be envious, it will kill your joy. And then finally, anger is another joy killer. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. And there are some, some believers who, who you get angry about seeing the devil winning. Like, and it's okay to be holy, you know, just some holy indignation, but like you're verbally on social media, you're ranting and raving at people who matter to God. Some of us here have been hurt from the hurtful things Christians say with the best intent. I'm not saying we don't call sin, sin, and we don't call wrong, wrong. I'm saying that the people that are doing that, God still loves. Jesus, when he came up to the woman caught in adultery that was getting ready to be stoned, he said, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. He didn't get mad at her. He didn't get angry with her. When he goes to the well and he sees the woman who's had five husbands, he doesn't get mad at her. He doesn't get angry with her. He extends love and grace to her. In both of those situations, he says, now go and sin no more. When Jesus meets and has lunch with Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector at the time, Zacchaeus was skimming off the top. He was, he was all about the money, skimming off the top. He has lunch. At the end of lunch, Zacchaeus decides he's gonna follow Jesus. He's gonna repay everything that he's stolen Jesus wasn't mad at Zacchaeus. He wasn't, he wasn't posting on social media. How dare these tax collectors do this? He wasn't posting on social media. These people pushing this agenda, how dare they do this? Can I tell you something? Your citizenship, if you're a believer of Christ, is in heaven, not in America. We should vote according to our morals and principles. But whether we win or lose an election should not change how you treat people. We can't be angry. The Arizona Republic in 1995 reported a story of a man who had a cockroach problem. If you've ever had a cockroach problem, those things are evil, pure evil. <laughs> Did some measurements, realized he needed to do bug bombs. He said two would actually take care of his apartment, but he wanted to make sure these cockroaches were gone. He bought 25 canisters. <laughs> oh, it gets better. He sets off all 25 canisters in his apartment with the pilot light still lit on his stove. $10,000 worth of damage later, that summer the cockroaches were back. When you live a life of anger and lack of joy and hope, you cause more damage than you can possibly imagine. These things will kill our joy. 
So what do, we, what do we have to embrace? What should we as believers embrace in this psalm? And we're gonna, we're gonna go through these quickly. Again, I encourage you to spend some time in this psalm this week, just read through this. But what should we embrace? Psalm 37, three says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. The first thing we have to do is trust in God. Proverbs chapter three, verse five, if you're, if you're new to faith or you don't, aren't familiar with this passage of scripture, I highly encourage you to memorize this passage of scripture. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Don't lean on what you see in the natural, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. What's interesting is later on in Psalm 37, verse 23, it talks about the steps that God orders our steps. When we trust in God, he'll take care of it. And what, is this, what he's saying here is it's a complete trust, even when it doesn't make sense what's going on around you. When it doesn't make sense why you're not getting the promotion, when it doesn't make sense why you're not the one that's succeeding, when it doesn't make sense while society's going this way, why should I continue trusting in God? Because he will order your steps according to his plan. Why? Because we can only see things in the natural. God always works in the supernatural. God's at work right now for you and for your life. God, for some of you, you have situations that you're not seeing anything. All you're seeing is evil flourish in that situation. Know this, God's working. It may not turn out the way you want. I'm not promising you that. But I'm telling you, he's working and in motion right now on your behalf. We have to learn to trust in him, especially in the more difficult moments of life. God, if I just cheat on this little answer to this resume question or to this interview, if I could just fudge a little here, if I trust God, that job you want so bad may end up being what destroys you down the road. That relationship you're hoping for, God knows. There's an old Garth Brooks song, if you're familiar with it, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Yes, I'm a 90s country boy. <laughs> God knows what you need far more than we know what we need. We have to learn to trust him. The second thing we must do as a joy filler to have hope in our lives is we must do good. My leadership coach, uh, he coaches a number of our staff, coaches the executive team. Uh, I've been with him now for almost 10 years. And I, there, throughout those 10 years that we've been together, there've been moments where it's just been really stressful. Like there's just some crazy things that have happened. And sometimes in those moments, there's some, uh, I'll say it this way, there have been some evil things happening. And I'm, I'm stressing out, I'm frustrated. And he looks at me and he goes, Leo, just do your job. Something so simple, like think about that. Just do your job. What God says is trust in me and do what I've called you to do, do good. Just do what I've called, well, what is that? What does do good mean? And I'm not talking about giving to the poor and I'm not saying those things don't matter. What God's saying is, is promote the gospel. Tell people about Jesus, give them hope. The greatest evangelistic tool we have today at our disposal in the American society is church. The entire New Testament, everything God does in the New Testament, he does through a local church and through a local community of believers. Can you do good outside of church? Yes, I'm not making that argument, but I'm telling you, more people have come to know Jesus, the salvation knowledge of Christ, have become disciple and followers of Christ in church than they have in one-on-one. -on -one. That does not preclude you from having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with people about Jesus. So when it says do good in the Old Testament, what God's saying is being a part of the church, be a part of the community that I've, I've called you to be a part of and share the love and the grace and the goodness of God. If you're worried about your kids and what they're getting week in and week out from the school system, Come be a part of our kids' ministry here. Be a part of what Pastor Aaron was talking about just a few minutes ago. Invest in this generation to teach them what's right. Teach them what's wrong. Be a part of their development and their spiritual journey with them. Trust God and just do our jobs. When we do that, when we focus on doing good, because here's, here's the reality, I wanna say this, because if I, if I don't, you'll miss it. It leads to the next point. Joy filler number three is delight yourself in the Lord. These two goes hand in hand. You cannot simply be against everything that is bad. You have to be for something good. Let's say that again. Some of you need to hear that. You cannot be against everything that's bad. 
You have to be for something good. You can't always argue over what is wrong. You have to be celebrating what is right. Psalm 37, four, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. The psalmist isn't saying here that your desire for more money, your desire for a bigger house, your desire for certain things is what God's going to answer. What he's saying is when you begin to trust in God, when you begin to do good, when you begin to delight in the things that God delights in, what you begin to find is your heart begins to become like God's. Your heart begins to become like God's. If you've been married for any season of time, what you begin to see is, is as a couple, I actually enjoy and delight from time to time, not as often as she would like taking my wife shopping. She also enjoys from time to time, not as often as I would like, playing a board game. Because when you, begin to, when you begin a relationship, when you begin to focus on the good things in each other's lives, and we begin to, the scripture says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. When you begin to delight in God and you begin to do good and not worry about the, not being, always just being against what's bad, you begin to want to do the things God has for you in your life. Which leads to the final point, commit your way to him as a joy filler. When you commit your way to the Lord. Now, let me encourage you. If you are a, Psalm 37, four is a great, uh, I call it a fireplace mantle or bumper sticker scripture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Man, that just feels good, doesn't it? Like, oh man. So we think delighting in God means we're gonna feel good about coming to church. You know what? I'm gonna delight in God. I feel good about going to church today. You know, maybe, maybe you, you clapped a little. Uh, maybe you, 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 during worship, you, you at least moved your lips. I encourage you, if you get a chance, like just next weekend during worship, just, just jump in, dive in, worship God, regardless of who's around, sing at the top. The reason I like sitting in the front row, nobody behind, no, nobody's in front of me, I sing at the top of my lungs. Like, and ask the worship team, they got earplugs in, they can still hear me half the time. <laughs> when you're reading scripture, you can't just pull out a bumper sticker verse and go, hey, look, this is so pretty, it feels good. You gotta read the passage, the verses that are before and after it, the chapters that are around it, especially in the books of the Bible and in the New Testament. Psalms are a little different because they do stand alone as each Psalm many times. But you gotta read what's around it because it's a delight to yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And then the very next verse says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, there it is again, and he shall bring it to pass. So we have to commit everything we do to God. When you do that, the things that steal your joy, when you trust in God, when you delight yourself in God, when you do good for the things that God's asked you to do, you find yourself full of joy regardless of what success looks like around you. You find yourself ecstatic about what's happening because you know what? You know how it ends in Revelation chapter 22. At the end of the book, we win. You know that it's going to be like fading grass, a green, a flower that's here and gone. And you know that you have a hope for an eternity. So I wanna, I wanna close, I wanna have a little house moment here just for a minute for those that are, for the believers that are here. What's gonna happen the next time the person lies and cheats, gets the promotion? What's your response gonna be? You're gonna fret about it? You're gonna be anxious about it? You're gonna get angry about it? You're gonna envious of it? where you choose to trust God to do what he's called you to do and keep moving down the path that he's leading you on when you trust him. But let me take it a step further beyond the individual. Church, what happens if we lose our freedom of religion? What happens if we can no longer meet freely in a building and worship together? Will you still trust God? I don't know that that's really going to be a reality in my lifetime. Maybe my grandkids, potentially, if we continue down the path we're on, and if history is anything, history is a cycle of, of re repetition, and history right now is repeating itself in some pretty heavy ways. But what I think is more reality that I think we will be dealing with over the next five to 10 years as a culture, what happens if we no longer get a tax credit or exemption for our financial gift? What happens if standing up for the word of God causes you to be a social exile and you no longer can get hired. What happens if your kids get picked on 
because they're choosing to stand up for the word of God. What's your response going to be? If we're not careful and we focus on the evil that's happening, man, that's stressful. But let's remember, none of this can steal our hope and joy. We still serve a God whose love exceeds everything. We still have an eternal hope in a new heaven and a new earth that will exceed the current beauty of what we understand right now. When we become focused on eternity, it won't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats in the seat making the decision, won't matter the laws that get passed, it doesn't change what we are called to do as believers, which is glorify God and bring others to him. I don't know about you, that's something that gives me hope and joy that I can face no matter what's going on around me. I've got someone who loves me so much, he's gonna make sure my life's taken care of and he has paved a way for me to have an eternal hope in him. We you bow your heads, close your eyes with me? Maybe you're here today and you say, Leo, I don't, I don't know that I am secure in that eternal hope. I don't know that I really have the ability to see a future in my life right now. Everything around me just looks like it's going to chaos. And and I want that joy and that hope you're talking about. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. Scripture says, if we simply confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and that he died for us, we can be saved. I'm gonna ask everyone to say this prayer with me this morning. Will you say this with me? Dear Jesus, I need your hope. I want an eternal future. I ask you to forgive me of the mistakes I've made. And from this day forward, I wanna trust in you with all my heart. Guide my steps, Jesus. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate those who said that prayer today. If you said that prayer, whether it's for the first time or coming back to Jesus, we don't wanna harass you. We're gonna honor this moment, but we're asking you to let us know. We wanna give you a free seven-day devotional, give you some great next steps, pursuit of Jesus, some tools we put together from Pastor Eric for you to be able to to start and continue down this journey. Send us a text to the number 55498. Send the words, I decided to 55498. You don't have a church home, you're visiting with us as a guest this week, and we invite you to come back. Give us a couple more weeks, try us out. See, what, uh, see if this isn't a place where you can find your element. That's part of the reason we say it that way. Uh, you're looking for a place to connect and feel like family. This is a great opportunity. We'd encourage you to come back. Check out with us. Fill out a connect card. Sit, connect with our team out in the lobby, just out and to the left here as you go. They've got a gift for you they'd like to get for you and help you know what some of those next steps might be. Our prayer team is here every week. This weekend, they will be around front. If you have a need in your heart and in your life, something that you want to join your faith with others, they would love the opportunity to pray with you. We would encourage you just as we dismiss to make your way forward through the crowd, come up here and don't leave without joining your faith with them and praying with them. Would you stand to your feet? You don't wanna miss next week as we continue our series in the Psalms. But before we go, I wanna say a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great week.